Hey YouTube, so one of the easiest ways that you can actually move and live abroad is to volunteer. Now it does take a little purse depending on where you go and for how long, but if you can swing it, it's a really wonderful way to accomplish a lot of things easily. And I'll go into some of them now for a quick example before giving some anecdotes from my own experiences as a volunteer in Micronesia. I don't think I'll have time to cover living at the monastery in Nepal today, but I'll certainly cover that in another video. Um, and so one of the coolest things about being a volunteer, and it doesn't take as much money as you might think, is that you can integrate into the community. You do integrate into the community really easily, really fast, really warm. There's lots of resonation because the people there know that you're there in some capacity to help do something. And so automatically everyone is very well disposed to you and you will be very mm -hmm, made to feel at home in what otherwise could be a closed off, very sort of icy society, depending on where you go. And so that's one of the things. Another really great thing is that it's sort of, uh, it can be easy to get into those roles, right? Because if you actually can swing it, then what will happen is there's not a ton of people that are lining up for volunteer positions. And so there's not as much competition for a lot of these roles. And some of them are really amazing places. Again, I volunteered for a year in Micronesia, which I'll talk about today. And I also volunteered in Nepal inside of a Buddhist monastery where I lived amongst the monks while they were reciting their Tibetan scripts during the puja. I mean, it's just really, really cool, amazing experiences that I don't think you could have if you weren't a volunteer. And the third, that I, and then before I go into the actual Micronesia story, really cool benefit is that you start as a volunteer, but you don't stay a volunteer unless, unless you don't do a good job or you know or or unless you leave but for an example with me and Chuk, both my friend taylor who went to school as an architect and she came out there as a volunteer like me and then while out at blue lagoon a resort i'll talk about um on one end of the island at a bar hit a conversation up with some other business guy that was out there to build some homes and so, you know, it, she ended up getting a job as a CAD designer to help with the designs of these island homes out there. Um, in the case of myself and other volunteers, we all went out to volunteer as teachers, which is a really easy way to go out and volunteer. Really, if, if you can teach something in some subject, then that's a really great way for you to get started. Um, usually the school will offer you a paid contract after your volunteer role has gone or someone else in the community will offer you some sort of position they will because again you're going to be very immersed as a volunteer you are immersed into these communities into these cultures into these societies and so you really do form a lot of close-knit connections that will lead to tremendous opportunities and so Every single place that I went as a volunteer, I was offered a paid role. It was my own decision to continue moving because I wasn't ready to settle down yet. But otherwise, I would have and could still be in both of those places now. And so I will today go through uh, some of the volunteering in Micronesia. And it will apply to, I think, a lot of situations and so it would be helpful, um, hopefully, if, if nothing else, um, perhaps entertaining. And that entertainment and that help and that aid, advice, whatever, is all being done and continues to be done for Ashley Huestisen, who is just a lovely, sweet, adorable human being who is still sitting in a Thai prison cell going on four years. And so all you have to do to help bring her to freedom faster is just subscribe to this channel. And by doing that, you directly as a person are going to be contributing to her voice being heard faster. And as soon as her voice is heard, big things will happen. So please subscribe, like, comment. This is all for Ashley. And so hopefully it will be helpful to you and you can be helpful to Ashley. So thank you very much. 
Um, and so for me, I was still in university and one of the good places that you can go to find a volunteer, obviously nowadays you, the internet is probably um, ubiquitous and even then it was, but it was still not totally. And so at university, there are the boards where they have the different notices and the signs and the placards and the bulletins and whatnot. And um, there was something, a flyer that stood out, World Teach, a program ran out of Harvard that basically offered volunteer positions to go and teach in all of these really exotic destinations nations around the world. So they had like in Africa and Asia. They actually had one in Thailand, I remember. But of course, I really love the islands, the tropic remote, and they had one out in Micronesia and they had one in the Marshall Islands. But I compared the two and decided that Micronesia would be way better because the Marshall Islands are basically just flat. It's like a flat country of small islands, really small that are getting swallowed up by the sea. And just, I mean, it would be to me sort of like a bird living in a cage. So now, again, you might say that about an island, but there's a certain size or complexity, if you will, to islands that to me make them just like a whole world, not a cage. Okay, but then if the Marshall Islands would be more like a cage because they lack those things. Okay, they're just flat atolls basically in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Whereas Micronesia also has lots of those. But Chuuk State, which was where one of the programs was offered, Chuuk and Pohnpei and I think Koh Rai, um, there's four states in Micronesia spread out over like 3,000 miles. And so while I was looking at Chuuk, it had all, it's inside a lagoon world's second or third largest lagoon and there's like five main large islands and then a hundred small outer scattered islands and it's all surrounded by fringed reef and the islands are sort of volcanic in nature and that they have these green lush tropical vibrant dense raw mountains just sort of prehistoric looking mountains dense fog around the tops just rising out if you've ever been to oahu down near kaneohe bay or draw driven down kamehameha highway um then you would sort of know what i'm talking about because kamehameha highway is sort of cut through those two the two jungle mountains and so it's it's sort of like that same just really prehistoric jurassic scene out there and so you have these, but then you have like the flatlands and then you have the beaches and you have the plant. I just like everything. So everything that you want. So really cool. So I saw the flyer, but you can also find them in churches or community centers or, of course, online. There's a lot of them, but you need to be watch, beware of scams because one of the things with um, World Teach is they did require me to send a $2,000 deposit. So that's, again, to be a volunteer, you do have to have some money to get started. But if you can swing it, it's a really great way to get started because of all the benefits that I've talked about and not yet talked about. But I had to send in a $2,000 deposit because that was in case I quit the contract early because it was a 10-month contract. And so, you know, some people, they go from living in the USA, American standards of living, They've never left their home, and then suddenly they go out into the middle of the Pacific Ocean to a completely different culture, and maybe they're like, no, I can't do this. And then so that was World Teaches, the program's way of making sure that they wouldn't lose a ton or too much money if volunteers pulled out, or in the case of this guy, Victor, that was with us, had a medical situation, a medical emergency, so he had to leave. There's like different reasons, and so that was the reason I had to pay that deposit. But they covered that deposit covered my airfare like my travel and so you know it was it was a good deal and it was also like in the office the guidance office of my university and so and it was run out of harvard so i did the due diligence to make sure that it was legit and so you always have to do that especially because sometimes you do have to send a little money for something with volunteering you certainly have to provide for yourself when you're there i received a stipend in micronesia i received nothing in nepal so you do have to have means for at least a certain amount of time but once i found that opportunity and then i sent in the email and i you know cover letter the process wasn't very difficult they don't make it so difficult because again they want volunteers the peace corps uh, International Organization of Migration, Red Cross, Bridges uh, Without Boundaries, Doctors Without Borders, World Teach. There's lot, there's so many. There's so many. And so, you know, you just look for your interest and then you can go to these amazing places, right? I wanted to go in the middle of the Pacific Ocean to this place called Micronesia because I thought it looked really cool. And so that's what I did. And I 
left before actually graduating university and took a long plane ride called the Island Hopper from Florida to California to Hawaii to Kwajalein to the Marshall Islands to Pompeii and then finally the seventh flight was to Juke so it was a really 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 long trip over there but I as we got all to Hawaii the whole group of us because it was a group I forget I'm not going to try to count right now I know the people's names but we all came together there right from all over the U.S. and uh, other no there were some people that actually we didn't meet until until Juke because they came from Europe Julia Ariella uh, ooh, I don't want to get stuck on other names uh, anyway from Finland and so once we got over there to Juke as volunteers, another good thing about that is everything's taken care of when you get there. So we were flying, we're flying above this beautiful archipelago of azul, turquoise, emerald water dotted with green palm islands fringed with white sand and just the waves crashing on the, sh the shore because again you're only a few thousand feet up and there's the island of Weta, the the capital of Chuk with its big mountain I don't remember the name long name rising up and you see the little airport down there and that's like where we're going to be living at and it's like this little you can see this little settlement that's sort of ringing a part of the island and then it's just like mass of jungle and and just green and blues and just such a cacophony of colors a symphony an orchestra made by nature that was really sublime to to view um, even more so than as a child when we would fly in on the charters from New Smyrna Beach to Marsh Harbor to visit my grandparents who lived in Manowar on Manowar and so just exceptionally beautiful and we landed and then as soon as the door opened up the plane was engulfed with humidity because there's not <clears throat> there's not like a, maybe some of you've never been to uh, out of the US right you're used to US airports where they all have the gosh what are those things that come out to the plane the terminal things that you walk through I don't remember but there you know it's just like they push they, some guys just pushes a stairs up to the side of the plane and they open the door and you know you just start going out very small airport no hardly any security I'll get to that right uh, to the <laughs> but easy to get things in and out of and so we got to to uh, the juke airport and as soon as we all walked in we we're already sweating between like the plane and going inside the little single terminal building very old very small and this one was already waiting for us saffron who was from america and was sort of in charge of the volunteer program in juke and so super great right because it's like they took care of all the travel so all I had to do was follow the instructions. Like once I applied and they said that I was approved and then they got my deposit, everything else was so easy from that point on. It was just like they did everything. It was like being in the military again, except a lot more fun because, well, pros and cons, pros and cons, less weapons. But you you get over there and then someone's there waiting for you and they're very friendly and they had the, the flowers and the drivers and the vans and we get our stuff and we all start heading up, introducing you know, people are chatting, chatty Kathy, chatty Kathy, but even then, like the first inklings of like, some people aren't going to like this as much came in, right? Because in Chuk, and I mentioned in another video, in Chuk, it's a very, very conservative, very Christian domineering culture. And so as we started to drive out of the airport and up the, there's not a lot of roads, right? There's sort of a road from the airport into the main part of town and then from the airport up to the hospital and everything else is like just sand dirt washed out most of the time vehicles can't get through so it's very primordial like just you know you're just walking around basically is how most of the people get around and so as we were driving out of the windows we you know we're looking everyone's glued like because it's just so different right um how everything looks and so tropical and 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 very 
small and quaint, but a lot of the people, the women, they were dressed in these very bright but very cumbersome garbs that covered most of their body. Whereas the guys, you know, they were like t-shirts or a lot of the boys, they like no shirt. And so I think it was Ariella who is from Estonia or something like that. She was in, you know, was inquiring about where they could go like good beaches for bikinis. And then Saffron, who was our, our coordinator, had to tell the girls, because Saffron was also in, they called them moo-moos, that that's not really allowed on the island. Like, women on the island have to stay covered up pretty much all the time everywhere you go there's only two places on the island that you can go where you can get away with it and they're both really far away from you know the townspeople because again like the townspeople it's not the same right there's a lot of domestic violence there's a lot of rape there's a lot of alcoholism the girls, the volunteers, they were accosted, I'm pretty sure every single one of them, at least once by men on the street randomly. It even once sort of occurred, started to occur until the person realized that they were with me. And so, you know, it's like it's not safe if you're not in a large group of people. And the laws aren't the same there, you know. They have a jail on Chuuk. But just to let you know sort of how things stand, if you murder someone on two, you'll go to the jail, right? But they let you out every morning. You just have to spend the night there. So, you know, it's not the same. It's very tribal. The islands are split up into villages. The police are sort of the masters of all. I mentioned on the other video already the time Taryn and I were walking in town and the police officers in that beat up blue truck came bouncing down the road, all of them drunk, drinking openly, throwing kids, COVID containers out of the vehicle, just laughing hysterically, just driving around, police right on the side of the truck. So, you know, it's just not, it's not the same. It's not the same as what you're used to, which I find very appealing. Like, I like that sort of controlled chaos that sort of just freedom. I really like it. Where That's one of the reasons I hate the U.S. is because it's so... <sighs> everything is so constrained. Same with Western Europe. You know, Germany, U.K., even like France, Paris. It's just like so... Ugh, you know, and so being out in a place like Micronesia is just freedom. Really, you know? And so that was something that happened immediately is that the girls realized that it wasn't going to be them just walking around like they were in Cancun, which, you know, I didn't enjoy particularly either. But at the same time, uh, you know, they it certainly affected them because they had to withstand stifling heat all the time, especially like in the classrooms where we would teach at. And I would be wearing swim trunks and a T-shirt, and no shoes. And they would be over there in their moo-moos just like <laughs> desperately fanning themselves because, of course, there's no AC and the fans don't work, okay? It's like, it's not, it's not like a, it's probably where you're used to. But it's also really cool because as soon as you get to these places, these volunteer places, you have someone like Saffron to start filling you in on things to let you know and to take you to a place to live which is what she did next. She drove around with the vans, two vans, and, and showed us all where we were living and dropped us off. And so I was really fortunate. Myself and a girl named Alice and another girl named Taryn, we were taken up to live in a compound that was formerly the first president of Micronesia's house and was currently occupied and owned by his daughters, Miss Mary and Rose Nakayama. Wonderful, lovely people. Just tremendously good-spirited, good-hearted people. And so that's really cool about volunteering is because you, like, how else would I live <laughs> at a former president's house? You know, it's like, and it was nice. Now, it wasn't like presidential palace in, you know, like a first world country nice, but when you're driving up and you're seeing like all of these tin shanty shacks that are corrugated iron and plywood that most of the people live in, and then you 
suddenly come up like this mountain pass going up this road where you're the only property. And then you get up to this elevated, that's been like carved out of the side of the mountain, this elevated flat land. It's got three houses in a row, boom, 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 spread out, spaced, lawn like a golf course, mango trees, pineapples growing, papayas, just all kinds of gardens, you know, pig, flowers blooming everywhere and you're up and then you look to the right and it's just this panoramic view of the lagoon, Chuk Lagoon, over to the other ridge line, just like, wow. And then, of course, inside the houses, you know, a lot of the places didn't have indoor plumbing. They have like sort of in Thailand or Nepal where you just kind of a hole, a hole in the ground. You know, they had just like American style bathrooms. And so, again, like, they did have other apartments and places because other volunteers had to stay at some places, like some apartments down in town, but they were very expensive and they weren't as nice. And Agora, like our property, it was, it was really one of a kind. And the two sisters, Miss Mary and Miss Rose, kept it up immaculately. And so, you know, and being with them very quickly because they were so well known and respected they were the daughters of the first president of the country it was like a super shot as far as entering into island society if you will so again volunteering has tremendous benefits because of all of the different additives that come together to make it as a whole and so Taryn, alice and i we ended up you know at this compound up on the side of a mountain overlooking just gorgeous just beautiful the most beautiful views i've ever at least tied okay at least tied for the most beautiful views i've ever seen and so we came into this house that had us greened in sort of dining room area and a little kitchen and three bedrooms and of course, the girls didn't want to share a bathroom, so I got the master bedroom. So I had my own bathroom, which really came in handy later once I started uh, buying the weed, the weed plants from this farmer who grew marijuana. Uh, he had like his own farm. I'll, I'll cover it. There's actually a picture on the YouTube channel of me with this farmer, Appy. And I got my arm around him, and I'm standing. I'm just standing in this field of pot because I used to go to his house once a month, and I'd buy a plant from him. And then, anyway, I'll get to that. Um, and so, and you know, having my own bathroom that was really good because that's where I would hang it and like cut all the weed and, and roll all the joints. And so it was good to have that private space because otherwise the house would have stank up. But so we were in that house. And everything was explained to us. So again, as a volunteer, it's like you have your hand held, which is really nice. If you've never left your country before, I think it's the best way to go. And I had left the country before to go down to visit family in the Bahamas, but I'd never left like internationally to go live and work. And so doing it with something like World Teach or World Peace or wherever you do some, some organization that really does these things, I think just makes the whole experience so much easier because you get to focus on the experience on being there on you know helping out on enjoyment instead of on all of the you know trying to figure out the travel details trying to make living arrangements not getting ripped off you know um integrating meeting people just like it's, it's, it takes all of that away and so saffron ran us through everything and told us the next day that we would start our training, right? So that all the volunteers got together at the school, Chuk High School, which if you've ever seen the movie Dangerous Minds, the Coolio did that song, I forget, uh, Gangsters, Gangsters Paradise, right? It was like that. It was like you're out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean on this little lagoon, on this little island, the Capitol Island. So there's like 50,000 people on it, but most of them live like in the little villages, not in the, in the city center, maybe like half do, and then half are spread out. And so this school, this Chuk High School, right? You like, you start walking up and it's surrounded by a chain league fence and you look in and already you can see it's dilapidated. Shutters are like broken, the paint chips, everything is just sort of soiled and dirty looking and very old. And then, and they got security at the gates, like these big Chuk guys, that are checking the students, right? So they're checking the students. And all these students, it's like 
being transported into the 90s, California, during like the gangs, right? It's just like they look like straight up bloods and crips. I mean, dressed like just all of them are just dressed like gangsters, the boys and the girls. I mean, the girls with the sunglasses and the bandanas and the gold teeth, because that's the thing about you. For two keys people, it's a symbol of status to have gold teeth. Probably because they have such terrible oral hygiene. I mean, you'll go around the island and just most everyone's teeth are just rotted out of their head or, or they're orange and brown because of betel nut. Ugh, so much. Which you probably aren't aware of, but I'll talk about as well. But so these students inside of the school, it's just like straight up gangster city. And they got like thug, thug, thug walking around with these speakers blaring out hip hop, like 90s hip hop. At least it's good hip hop, not like this whatever mumble stuff that they listen to today. But and and so and it's very clicky. And this is like the place that they take us to, to work. But before the school opened up, there was an a orientation, which is really good if you're a volunteer, because again, during that orientation, I think it was two weeks, or maybe it was less than that, but we would go there every day, and we would meet with Saffron, and we would meet with locals, and they would come in, and they would talk to us, they would tell us the specifics about their culture, their island, they would teach us a little bit of Chukis, Rananim, Miwawam, Mimota, <laughs> do you have a motorboat, <laughs> um, and so like they would teach us the phrases and and they would teach us the food and you know little stuff that they do they they are really good at arts and crafts or how to make the hats and everything out of the palm fronds because it's so hot the sun is blazing there blazing sun so everyone else is always wearing these big hats that are usually made out of the palm fronds because it's free it doesn't cost anything and so it was a really self-sufficient place until actually the west came in and started giving them all of the plastics and stuff because they had no concept of of trash of like litter because everything they made was natural and it just naturally just biodegraded but now unfortunately a lot of the areas is covered in trash because you know, they they didn't change their behavior. They finish it, they just throw it away. But now they're throwing away plastics and this and that instead of coconut husk and leaves. And so, uh, you know, there's streams on Juke that are just look like maybe a river in Mumbai as far as just being absolutely clogged with garbage. But then if you go off to the beach, you know, it depends where you go. But you don't see anything or you see some, but it's certainly a problem there. But nevertheless, as a volunteer, getting that orientation and... I was already starting with 10, 11, 12, I'd have to think, count it out, I don't do that right now, other people that were all there for the same reason as me. You know, there was a bunch of girls, mostly girls, there were some guys, most of the guys were gay, <laughs> and so, which is fine, like, I, I have lots of gay friends, um, but, like, so we were all there together, so it's like, all right, you're already starting with a base group of friends, and it's a pretty big group of friends, and because we couldn't all live at the same place, like, we're split up in different parts of the island, so then we all meet people around our different places, and then so, we, like, within a short amount of time, we're having get-togethers, we're having parties, we're going here and there, not the kind of parties like on Thailand, no, 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 no. these parties, weed and alcohol is all I ever saw uh, out in Micronesia, I mean, they just, uh, I'm not, they probably had, I'm sure they have other things that I just never came across. It was just always weed and alcohol and tobacco. But, you know, parties with, with the weed and alcohol and tobacco at the different places with all the different volunteers. Because, again, like, they're your people. And they're all, like, in your age group. And, of course, everyone's single. And so, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's a pretty cool situation, I think. And so I was 28 when I did this, by the way, just so you're aware. Um, it wasn't like you have to do this when you're super young. And there were guys there like Bill, who was in his late 40s. And so there's a range. There's a range. But I would say most were in their mid to late 20s. But there were, you know, there's outliers. And again, some of the volunteers, they ended up staying there. Some other guy, I can't remember his name, but he stayed. He had come as a volunteer in the 70s and he was still living there working as a school teacher had a family bunch of kids running around hardly a tooth in his head but he was always cackling you know with a smile and a laugh i mean it, it seemed like a really light a nice life for him uh you know he certainly wasn't rich as far as money but he was surrounded by love and by family and in a community that he was very well ingratiated and accepted into and so you know it's really um, depending on where you go it's it's a really nice 
um, experience. And so, uh, it, at least as a volunteer, eventually you have to start doing your job, which for me and the other volunteers was teaching at various schools. Most of us at the high school, I was 10th grade mathematics. And so it's definitely, there's a lot of culture shocks depending on where you go. Uh, again, with the Chukis, they have specific ones like tea rowing and all these different things that you're like social etiquettes and behaviors that you have to learn about so that you don't cause offense and anything like that. But then eventually you go to work and you start to, that's when you really start to become involved because now, you know, us as teachers, we're meeting all of our students and, <laughs> Oh, it was crazy, crazy kids, really crazy. But, you know, you get to like them and they get to like you. Um, certainly the expectations for cannot start out like they are what you're used to because they're just brought up completely different. But over time, you know, it's just, it's a really cool, great experience. And then after school, you get invited to you know, hang out with them and go to the, the, the parks and to play the, the, the baseball or the, the, the volleyball. They love volleyball. They love volleyball. That's like their pastime. So they're always playing volleyball, which I always really like volleyball too. So, you know, playing lots of volleyball. And it's just a really um, a, a fun experience. But there are certainly headaches. But at least in Juke, it was great because the school it's very poor there and so the school wasn't able to afford lunch for their students and most of the students weren't able to afford lunch and so that means that at least when you are over at Chuk as a teacher you only taught from 8 15 until 12 15 so four hours four hour days right so there's no there's no fans Finding chalk can be almost impossible. There's certainly no whiteboards or computers or at least maybe I'm sure there probably are some now. But back then in 2015, there was not. And so, you know, um, those benefits of like only having to teach for four hours a day and they're not bad. You know, I mean, they're, they're pretty easy classes, pretty fast. You're super under equipped, but it is what it is. No, uh, and then after you finish the day, it's twelve fifteen, and so you have so much time to go out and do things. And as a teacher, right, you had those. And Micronesia is part of the U.S. It's a protectorate, so they're under the U.S. system. So you get the same days off. And as a U.S. citizen, you don't have to have a visa or anything. You can just go there. You don't have to have a passport. If you have a driver's license, you can fly to Micronesia. You can start living there. You can start working there. Because the same with Puerto Rico or the U.S. Virgin Islands. You can just go to these places, right? If you didn't know that, you can just go to these places. You don't need a passport. You just can just go and just start living there, just like you could any other state. And so um, while we were there as the school teachers, we would, after school, start to experience the lifestyle of these other people, which is, for me, the whole reason I wanted to get out and explore the world, or one of them. I wanted to see how other people live. I wanted to experience other cultures, new environments. And so, you know, going out and meeting with the locals, going to such things as a pig slaughter, which is really, really hectic, or cockfights, which, are, you know, it's like a, a thing, same in Thailand, like cockfighting is big there. And so you go to these these places or you go to the, the kids, they'll show you, they'll take you into the jungle and show you abandoned lighthouses or old wrecks that have washed up on the beach. And the cool thing about these places is there's no rules. There's no any buzz kills that are standing out there saying you can't do that don't do that that's against the rule you kids get off the lawn there's none of that okay there's five-year-old jumping off the bows of shipwreck boats in between heads of coral and they're just diving in like fishes okay so you know their teeth are rotted out of their head but they're always laughing they're always smiling they're always covered by sunshine so who's really living right you know i think add some fluoride in the water and you're probably pretty good to go as far as how they like to do things over here. But that is just the great benefits of being a volunteer. Now, depending on where you live, right, um, it obviously dictates tremendously how much you have to spend. 
we as volunteers were given a $400 stipend every month, which sounds like a lot. And so again, they took us down to Guam Rose Bank. They opened up a bank account for us. I still have a bank account in Micronesia. I'd never use it, but it's there. So that's cool. Um, and we would get a stipend, but that it wasn't very much because Micronesia is, is not a super cheap place. It is, but it isn't. It's like when you get there, it is is like you can go down to the market if you live like a local, if you eat like a local, it's really cheap because you can go to the market and you can get whole lobsters for less than five dollars. Easy. You can get fresh 20 pound, 25 pound bluefin tuna, freshest sashimi you've ever had for no more than twenty dollars. Of course, mangoes, 50 cents, like all these. It's very, very cheap, but anything imported like milk or cheese or bacon is very expensive. And then, of course, the electricity can be pretty expensive. And the rent, of course, we were volunteers. We didn't have to pay rent, but the rents were pretty expensive. They're like eight or $900, which is a lot. Because in Bali, for a house, you can pay $285 for a whole house, one bedroom house, but you're still a kilometer from the beach. In Thailand, I was paying less than $400 for a house with a million dollar view. In El Salvador, I was paying around 500 which was a bit overpriced, but again, on a really beautiful property, beautiful view. Ukraine was about $300. Um, Honduras was about $400. And so Micronesia is, you know, pretty expensive compared to a lot of other places. So you should account for that. So even though I was getting that stipend because you wanted to go out on the boat trips to PSR, which I'll talk about, or you wanted to buy the box wine to go to the parties, or you just wanted to go and buy some joints, because first you would buy, I'm behind it in this, first you would buy joints, but then I met the guy, the farmer, I'll get into that. And so, you know, I went there with about $6,000, but I ran out of money before I actually, the, the volunteer stuff was up. But then I got the two thousand dollar deposit back, which is how I got over to Nepal. But it was it was pretty crazy for a while, and so yeah, I think that if you are really interested in living moving abroad, that if you can figure out a way to get between five and ten thousand dollars, volunteering is a really awesome way to do it. I'll talk more about Micronesia and stuff um, in other videos, but just the concept of having the ability to be led out somewhere to have people waiting to pick you up people there waiting to house you to give you orientations and for the community to know that you're there in some helpful manner so that you're automatically invited in with hopefully other volunteers who are there with you that already establishes a core friend group just there's just a real great amount of benefits to it and so i would really encourage people to pursue that if they're able especially if you have never left your home to live and work internationally before because it's a great way to go and get started someplace see if you like it and if you do like it then you will certainly be able to find a way to stay there and to make the money to make it work i've met by now more than a thousand people all over the world they all have individual stories of how they went from where they started to how they were where they are now and they all manage to find a way and you will too if you know you take those steps and so uh, check out volunteering it's a you know and also of course it makes the world a better place hopefully in some capacity now if you have reached the end of this video, thank you. Subscribe. Subscribe before you stop watching. Subscribe right now before you stop watching. Otherwise, shame on you because this is all about helping Ashley West Eisen. And she really is a human that deserves help. So I hope that you will help her. And I will continue talking about Micronesia and being a volunteer and other benefits and what not in the next video. And eventually I'll get to Nepal and we'll get to Thailand and hot in the biscuit and how to actually more business centric. It's just sort of uh, going to lead its way there. So we will see you for the next one.